Hey guys, welcome to Did You Get That On Film? On this podcast, we deep dive into horror movies, so it is full of explicit content as well as spoilers. Please be advised. Now, let's get to the show. This is Did You Get That on Film, where we discuss characters in terrible situations that we would never find ourselves in. I am your host, DP, and with me always is my friend, someone who would never get rid of a lucrative character in the middle of this economy. Root, how are you doing? Hello, hello. I am doing pretty good. Um, A lot better than Paul Sheldon, that's for sure. With that being said, (laughs) let's get into it because I have so many things to say. So for those that don't know what the hell we're talking about, (laughs) today we are going to be covering Misery. This is actually a user requested episode. So shout out to Wolf Dad. We really appreciate you, Wolf Dad. You are always listening, always interacting. We love your recommendations. Please keep them coming. So we're really excited to be doing this one for you. So Misery, this was released in 1990, and it was directed by Rob Reiner, and it's an adaptation of Stephen King's 1987 novel of the same name. Um, And it's just a standalone movie. There are no sequels or anything like that. Thank God. But there is, there's a show, I don't know if you ever heard of a show called Castle Rock. Have you heard of that? Yes, but I have never, ever had any um, desire to watch it. Okay, heard. I mean, that's just the truth. I mean, that's, I'm not judging. I've never watched it either. I've only heard about it in passing, just seen the name mentioned sometimes. It got canceled. It's an American psychological horror TV show, and it is essentially inspired by the characters, settings, stories that were created by Stephen King in his fictional town of Castle Rock, Maine. So that's the whole like premise of the show. But season two of Castle Rock actually served as a loose prequel to Misery. It was actually showing Annie Wilkes in the years before the events of misery so it was like um the early years of annie wilkes so i was like that's kind of interesting i don't like prequels i don't know i'm trying to think if there are any prequels that i can think of that i like what did we say oh that uh that omen is it's about to come out with a prequel oh i want to go see it yeah I was kind of happy there was a prequel because I was like, I don't know if this movie needs another remake. No. (laughs) No. No. Well, Dan, tell us how you really feel. The Omen as well as um, the Texas Chainsaw franchise are two franchises that need no type of like prequel or remake. They are so prequel and remaked out. And then on the opposite end of that spectrum is the Hellraiser franchise, which has nothing but sequels. And it's like, damn, y'all are off the chain over here. They've been back in time, forwards in time, around time, around the corner, back at one. (laughs) (laughs) But I guess let's just (laughs) let's just uh, jump into it and get started so we can um, start getting to the good parts. Because I have a lot of feelings about this movie and so I don't know if you guys liked it or not if you listened or not but when we did our episode on the exorcist I'd reread the book just so I could add little tidbits from the book that I thought gave the movie a little bit more context I reread misery again for this because surprisingly misery Um, book and movie are pretty different they have some pretty uh different events 
same general story, but um, the characters don't change. But it's just so there's some things I like from each and some things that I don't like from each. So I'll just kind of like call out some little some little differences. But yeah, let's get started. So the movie opens up on this man named Paul Sheldon. He is a writer and he is typing away on his typewriter and he is at a snow covered cabin in the mountains and he is just finishing a brand new book. It's an untitled work. He is just pulling the last page out of his typewriter and he is handwriting the end on it and he places it in a leather satchel to take with him and to celebrate finishing his book, he opens a bottle of Dom Perignon to have a glass and he smokes one single cigarette. So Paul then loads his newly finished book into his car and he starts to drive down this snow covered mountain. But as Paul is driving, the weather is starting to get really bad. There is an incoming blizzard. And it's causing really poor visibility and really slippery roads. So, of course, Paul ends up crashing his car pretty badly. And he runs off the road. The car flips. Now, in the book, so this is something that is going to, it's almost like a theme throughout. In the book, Paul Sheldon is a recovering addict. And he drinks a lot. And so he's wasted in the book when he gets into this accident. I'm not entirely sure why they took out a lot of the addiction parts of the story. I don't know if they thought that it would make Paul seem more sympathetic or not, but yeah, so in the and it's not that it's his fault there is still a blizzard in the book. But it's also a blizzard that he, one, knew was coming, although they do say that it's going to like deviate on the path a little bit. So he was thinking he could make it. But also when he saw that it was coming, he was so wasted that he just felt like he could, like, he, like as a dude, he's like, I'm a man, I can get through this blizzard, you know? So he like actually passes up safety and keeps driving. They don't put any of that in the movie. No, they don't. Yeah, we just kind of end up feeling really bad for Paul. They also, in the movie, make sure that we understand that he didn't know that Blizzard was coming because they say it. Right. But yeah, so in the book, he knew it was coming. In the book, it actually starts to get bad and he continues on and he's drunk. So it's like when he crashes, it's like, well, yeah, of course you fucking crash. But in the movie, they kind of shy away from anything that has to do with Paul and any kind of addiction, whether it be like alcohol, drugs, anything. And that was such a huge part of the book, a huge part of the book. And so we'll get to why that is. But that's just something to keep in mind that Paul is not like a perfect character. But as Paul's flipped car is just left in the snow, we get a flashback scene of it's him and his agent, Miss Sindel, and they're in her office. And we get a shot of him, and he has that his signature leather satchel. And he's commenting to his agent that he no longer feels like he's a writer, a real writer, because he started writing these books. They're called um, the misery books. So these books are Victorian romance novels that center on a character named Misery Chastain. Apparently, they're wildly popular. They're his highest selling books. They make him a lot of money, like put your daughter through, through college type money. We learn that Paul is so sick about writing about this character that in his latest book, he just decides that he wants to kill her off completely and he wants to move past that. And he wants to, I guess, start writing more serious works. He just kind of wants to feel proud of his work again, be kind of taken seriously in the writer's circle. So Paul says that he never wanted misery to become his life. So he tells her in that flashback that he's leaving. He's going up to Colorado. So he always writes his book at the Silver Creek Lodge. 
That's where he finishes them. So that's where he was going to finish that. And that's where he's leaving when he's finishing this book too. So now we cut back to Paul and the crash and he is in pretty bad shape. So he is very bloody. He's knocked unconscious in his car, clutching this satchel with his book in it. And then we see someone roughly pry open the door of his car with like a crowbar. And then he is roughly dragged out of the car and he's given CPR by a woman who we will later learn is Annie Wilkes. She grabs him and his satchel and she drags him to safety because Annie is strong as fuck. You know what I thought about when, I, when she did that? Miss Trunchbull. Miss Trunchbull is just fucking big. She's like an Olympian. She's just a big fucking woman who's really strong. A- Annie gives those vibes. I know that in the movie it's um, Kathy Bates and we don't get a lot of instances of her exhibiting this strength. But in the book, they kind of point it out a lot. Annie is like kind of strong as fuck. And so she's able to really kind of pick Paul up with ease. You know, at any given point, she can like throw him over her shoulder, move him around. Do you think, thinking about like the differences between the book and the movie, because this is, I don't know if this is like, if you got this vibe. Do you remember when we were younger? My grandfather, he used to watch In the Heat of the Night. And once the show ran its course, they had their um, TV movies. And when I mm-hmm, watched mm-hmm. this movie, it had that made-for-TV vibe. It does have that made-for-TV vibe. It does, especially the ending. But do you think that the reason why they made the movie less graphic than the book was because they wanted to be able to play this movie on television i know at that time in the 90s it was like a movie would go do its um run through the theater and then it would be on tv in syndication and whatnot but it looks so made for tv it is just i don't know if it's just the colors or the the um the screen but it looks but it's not just that it's an old movie because it was actually made for tv Right. came out the same year, and it doesn't even feel like this. It almost feels like an it, episode of Murder, She Wrote. It does kind of feel like an episode of Murder, She Wrote. Oh, my God. I was like... It does. Where the fuck is Angela Lansbury? <laughs> I was like, y'all, I was like, this movie just, it doesn't... And I had to look when I was watching it. I was like, did this come out in theaters? But I was like, it had to come out in theaters because Kathy Bates won an Oscar. It did come out in theaters. I don't want to say it looks cheap, everyone, but if you have seen it, if you've seen this movie, you know, it just, it does not look like a movie that came out in a movie theater. It just looks very episodic because like Ruth said, they take a lot of stuff out of the movie that's in the book and it kind of gives it a sanitized version of it almost. It That's such a good way to describe it. It feels very sanitized. I mean, in the biggest way. With the director is Rob Reiner. Mm-hmm. He played years on All in the Family. So I wonder if that plays part of it. That is a good point. But then he, but he did Stand By Me before this. But Stand By Me doesn't even have... Do you think they had that same vibe? No. Stand By Me feels like a film. Right. There's some choices made, and I just don't know how I feel about them. Okay, well, let's, let's keep going. Because this, I hadn't seen Misery in a while. Me, neither, neither had I. Yeah, so Annie rips him out of the car. And so next, Paul is waking up in her house, and he is hooked to an IV. And he's delirious, but he can, he's floating in and out of consciousness and he just keeps hearing her telling him that she's his number one fan. And he's like, what the fuck is going on right now? He's obviously very confused. He's been out for days at this point. So Annie gives him a medicine called Novaril. This medicine, they don't say it in the movie, but they say it in the book. It is a codeine-based medicine. 
it has an effect on people that are already kind of, I guess, vulnerable. It causes respiratory distress. So in the book, Paul wakes up to Annie giving him mouth to mouth because he's dying, because she's given him too much medicine and she has to bring him back. And the way Stephen King describes her fucking rancid breath is He's like, it tastes like shit and chocolate (laughs) ice cream. So she's doing all of that. And he keeps hearing like, I'm your number one fan. So he's extra disgusted by Annie because he's like, he can taste her before he can see her. So he ends up coming out of it. He gets his first clear look at Annie. She informs Paul that they're just outside of Silver Creek, Colorado And it's been two days since his crash, and he's just been out this entire time. So she also tells him that in addition to being his number one fan, she's also a nurse. So that's how she has all this medical equipment. That's how she can do the IV. She has the pain medicine. So he wakes up. She gives him a couple of pills. She gives him the Navarro for his pain. So he dozes off again. Because the codeine based medicine, it makes him kind of tired. So it's a new day. He wakes up. She gives him even more Navarro. Now they they're setting this up in the movie, but they don't drive it home because they took out all of the addiction stuff. Like you said, just kind of sanitized it. By this point, I think in the I think in the book, Paul's been here a little bit longer than just like two days before he wakes up. By the time Paul is up, he's addicted. He cannot go without them. And they make it such a huge deal in the book that he needs these pills. When he doesn't, he's in a lot of pain because as we're going to learn, Annie did not take him to a hospital. She just brought him straight to her house. And she tells him that the blizzard was too strong. She couldn't risk trying to get him anywhere, which is fair. That part is probably true, the initial blizzard. But she also tells him that the phone lines are down and she starts going over the list of Paul's injuries. His arm was dislocated. She had to really like wrench it to pop it back into place. So it's in a sling and fucked up. But his legs are what's the most severely damaged. They are both really fucking broken. They take the sheet off to like look at his leg and they're so gross looking. They look pretty fucking horrible. It's like flesh covered bags of like nails. (laughs) It's like pink and blue like yawn. Yes. They're bruised up, crazy looking. And she has, she set his legs But not very well, right? Because he really needs to be in a hospital because he needs casts. His legs are really fucked up. She's just set them with old sawed off crutches. In this moment, if you don't know anything, if you're going into this blind, there was a blizzard. He did crash. If you believe her, it's very realistic that the phone lines are down. Okay, the roads are snowed. Okay, She seems pretty sweet, right? She seems really caring. She says that she would consider it an honor for him to recover in her home until the roads clear up and she's able to get him to a hospital. And so Annie, in this moment, I think that a lot of that is Kathy Bates. Because when I was reading the book, Annie almost immediately comes off as crazy to me. Not that she doesn't come off as crazy in the movie, but she also kind of comes off as endearing sometimes. I don't feel like she is like that in the book. I I feel like Kathy Bates made her a little bit more sympathetic in the movie. You think they played up uh, like childlike, like arrested development almost? It's like that in In the the movie. movie. She doesn't quite come off that way in the book. It's a lot of very similar behavior, lots of similar behavior. And the book, I hate Annie, and he wants you to. He wants you to hate her. There's really everything that she does, like, really turns my stomach. 
And then it's like, I just found myself in the movie, like caring for her sometimes. And I was like, what the fuck? What is happening here? Kathy Bates? I was like, I just, I don't know. And then I also found myself in the, when I was reading the book, I felt really sorry for Paul a lot. And in the movie, Paul just, he's kind of whatever. It feels like in the movie, Paul is just like not taking this seriously. And then all of a sudden at one moment, he's just like, okay, she has to die now. Yes. In the book, Annie puts Paul through hell. So by the time Paul decides I'm going to kill her, you're like, fuck yeah. Like, I wish I could kill her for you. You know what I mean? In the movie, it was like, they. I just felt like they didn't do a good enough job highlighting the worst parts of Annie Wilkes because Annie Wilkes is a horrible, horrible person. She kills babies. Kathy Bates just kind of, she plays her sweet side too sweet. You see Annie with her pig sitting on her sofa, like rubbing her with the pig sleeping in her lap. But they didn't put the parts in the movie where Annie gets in these like states and then she just like let, she just left, fucked off. She didn't feed her animals. She didn't milk her cows. Her cow ends up dying from like a ruptured udder and bleeding to death because she just did not milk it. They don't put any of that kind of stuff in there. And I just felt like it was a disservice to the story because the most important part of the story is how dark Annie really is. She is a quintessential villain. And I just feel like Kathy Bates, she does give childlike vibes sometimes. In the movie, they kind of play her like, whatever happened to Baby Jane? Yes. They play her like Baby Jane Hudson. So this is my thing. And I didn't watch Castle Rock. I don't know how much they get into. Like, I don't think you see her as a child I think that it's I think she's still older I think she's an adult in like her nursing days we don't get any backstory for the most part on Annie Wilkes I don't know what happened to her to make her like this I don't know if she's gone through some really crazy trauma they never say that she did you know I know that she clearly has a mental health disorder but Something about her is, at least in the movie, is giving trauma, right? Some sort of childhood trauma. Trauma. Yes. And she's almost kind of stuck in this state where it's like the sweet, it's like a kid that has tantrums. She has like the worst tantrums. But yeah, so let's get back to the story. So meanwhile... In New York City, we get a scene with Miss Sindel, his agent, and she is calling the local sheriff, Buster, to report Paul missing because nobody has heard from him since he checked out of the lodge when he finished the book. And this is something made purely for the movie. Buster and his wife, Virginia, who we're about to meet, his wife slash deputy, they do not exist in the book. They have a really tiny police station. It is literally just the two of them. It's Buster is the sheriff, deputy, wife, Virginia, secretary. It's very lacking. So, I mean, their filing system is just like fucking sticky notes on the wall. But either way, the police have been alerted. And Buster considers if Paul's disappearance is connected to the blizzard because his agent says... He checked out of the lodge last Tuesday and he's like, oh yeah, that blizzard was last Tuesday. So maybe he crashed. We don't know. So we cut back to Paul and Annie and Annie is giving Paul a straight razor shave. And Paul is telling Annie that it's a miracle that she found him in time after the accident. And Annie says, that wasn't a miracle. I was stalking you, Paul isn't alarmed enough by this statement in my opinion because I was like this was red flag number fucking one she said since I'm your number one fan I knew that you were staying at the Silver Creek Lodge finishing your book and she said at night she would drive up there to sit outside his cabin and just like watch the lights inside the cabin so it was only natural that she was there when he crashed 
And I was like, this is weird as fuck. And Paul's just kind of like, okay. <laughs> I was like, man. And she's just saying it like it's nothing. Casual. Casual. But I mean, I guess it's good that she was following him, you know? Yeah. Some might say it's like Pet Cemetery. Sometimes death is better. Because Paul really goes through it. Yeah. Not so much in the movie, which does a disservice to the movie, but in the book, I don't, there are times where even Paul was like, damn, I wish I was dead. Well, there's a big change in the movie from the book. Huge change. <sighs> Let's get to it. Huge. Yes. So this is a detail. The fact that she was following him, that's a detail that's in the movie that is not in the book. In the book, she's not following him. In the book, she has these depressive states because I do think that I don't know for sure. I think that it's a lot of different things I, I compounded. But Annie, I do believe, has bipolar disorder. And she goes through these different states. So she can be manic one minute and then she gets in these really depressive states. In the book, she really honestly just happened upon Paul because she was coming back from a place that she has in the mountains. She calls it her laughing place. It's a place that she goes when she gets in these depressive moods and she doesn't want to be in her house anymore. We don't know much more about it than that, that this is just like where she goes to get some like solitude. She really just stumbled upon him. She pulled out his wallet. She saw his name and she thought it was a coincidence. She didn't think that it was Paul Sheldon. Then she saw his picture, looked at his face, and she was like, I think this really might be the actual Paul Sheldon. But originally she she really was just being like a nice person and saving somebody that got into a car wreck. So there is that. But... Paul doesn't seem weirded out by this extremely weird statement that Annie just made. Um, but as weird as it is, at this point, Annie still does seem very nice. I don't know if she's giving us like red flag vibes because we know the story. But I feel like maybe to Paul, at this point, you still aren't suspecting that she's like a dangerous person. You know, I don't trust nobody that's too nice. That's because we do watch horror movies. But during this conversation, she tells him that she's read all of his books, but she's a super huge fan of the Misery novels. She knows all eight of them by heart. She's read and reread them. And so when Annie's done shaving him, Paul asks again if the phone lines are back up because he needs to call his daughter and he needs to call his agent. And Annie says that they should be back up soon because as soon as the roads are clear, they'll be able to fix the phone lines. The phone lines will start working. But she says if he gives her their numbers, she can try calling them. So on her way out of the room, she tells Paul that she notices that he was carrying around this new novel in this satchel. And she has it in the room with him. She asks if it would be okay if she read it. And he says that he usually doesn't let people read his books in the early stages, but because she did save his life, he gives her permission. So he doesn't have a title yet, but it is his first non-misery book in a long time. Annie is overcome with joy and she takes the book and she brings him some Navarro. And while all of this is happening, we get a scene of Buster and he is at the Silver Creek Lodge and he's looking into Paul's disappearance. The lodge owner said that everything was fine when Paul left. He checked out last Tuesday. He comes up there to write all the time. This is like his go-to like hotel in the area he ordered his bottle of dom which he always does and he drove off in his 65 mustang and it's the same car that he always drives up to the lodge so buster is doing his due diligence he's trying to figure out what happened 
to Paul. So we have to give it to Buster for that. Additionally, I didn't mention Buster and Virginia are old as fuck. They are elderly people. So I do just want to throw that out there. Not Howard and Pearl old. No. But too damn old to be the only cops in the city. Right. No offense. They're they're older people. But they're still smart. I mean, Buster is like the most competent police officer in this entire movie, apparently. In any horror movie, huh? He is just really... He like, is competent as fuck. He figures it out. He really does figure it I mean, in the way he figures it out, too, is crazy. But back in Annie's house, Annie is hand-feeding Paul some soup. And she's a bit sullen because she has some issues with the new book. She said there's too much swearing in the book. And Paul is like, kind of thinks that's kind of laughable. He tries to explain to her that this particular book is about some inner city kids, some slum kids. And he was like, I was a slum kid. Everybody talks that way. Annie is deeply offended by the statement. She's like, no, the fuck they don't. I mean, clearly she doesn't say that. (laughs) She would totally not like you. No, she would hate me. There were so many times, y'all, when I was taking my notes, because I always say, like, fuck and stuff. And I'm like, I'm like, Annie says, fuck that and stuff like that. She never says those things. Annie never. She curses one time this whole movie. But she's like, no, they most certainly do not. And she's like, do you think that I go to the bank? And I'm like, give me some effing pig feed or some bitchin' cow stuff. And she's going off. And Kathy Bates did such a good job with this because her eyes are not even like focused on Paul anymore. She is just like in another realm at this point. She starts to become like a, just like a little unhinged. And she is ranting to Paul about how she never uses profanity because she's so into what she's saying. She ends up spilling soup, the soup that she was feeding Paul on his bed. And this upsets her even more. And she jumps up and she yells, look what you made me do before kind of snapping back to reality and gathering herself and then profusely apologizing to Paul. And she says she just gets so worked up sometimes. And Paul is looking at her. And I guess it's kind of dawning on him for the first time that like, oh, no, she's a psycho. (laughs) If he didn't think that then when she goes to walk out, she just looks at him and she's like, I love you, Paul. And at this point, Paul is like, Paul, you in danger, girl, because Annie is kind of crazy. Kind of. Those, that mood swing that she just went through was a lot. She's freaking nuts. She's nuts. But at this point, she is nuts, but she doesn't seem homicidal yet. But... Paul clearly doesn't know what the hell is going on. He doesn't know what to say. He's just kind of like staring at her. And she further explains that she means she loves his mind, his creativity. That's all. She doesn't want him to get like weirded out. She does this a lot in the movie where she she explodes just a little bit. And then she immediately takes it back. And then she's nice. She's normal. Which, yes, she does do that in the book. but. Every single time in the book that Annie gets upset with Paul, Annie's going to hurt him in some way. So when she gets upset a lot, hurting him, even if it's not physical, which it often is physical, but one way that she hurts him in the book, which they took away in the movie, is that she withholds his medication And he, one, is in a serious amount of pain because he has these two broken legs. But two, he's addicted. And so he starts feeling really bad in the worst way. And she does that a lot with the pain medicine. It is a way that she has a hold on him 
in the book even more than just being afraid of her because in the book Paul is terrified of Annie absolutely terrified we never get that vibe from the Paul in the movie probably because James Can didn't read the book it's pretty obvious it's probably pretty obvious that he didn't read the book and it, to me it's pretty obvious that Kathy Bates did so this unhinged range of emotion that Annie just demonstrated, it's super alarming now. So now Paul is starting to get like a little bit worried because he's really vulnerable. He's like at her mercy. But we get a scene where we cut back to Buster in Virginia and they're out driving the road that Paul would have taken from leaving the cabin, heading back to New York. So they're looking for any signs of his car being in an accident. And Buster, who is like fucking monk, he spots that a tree is broken. And he's like, oh, this tree is broken. This could be a sign that there was an accident here. Virginia's like, how do you know that it wasn't just like broken by the the weight of the snow during the storm? And he's like, hmm, could have been, but my gut is no. Movie's gonna movie. Right. Almost everything to do with Buster is a movies are going to movie situation. So he goes into the bank, Paul's car rolled into, but it's just so much snow. He stops short literally just before finding Paul's car. I mean, he's just a mere feet away, but Paul's car is covered in snow. At that exact moment... Annie is also driving by and she sees them looking for Paul's car. Coincidentally, Annie is on her way into town to pick up Paul's newly released misery book, Misery's Child. Now, the thing with the car is, like I said in the beginning, there really isn't much in the book that Annie just like cannot do because in the book, Annie is very fucking strong. She knows that at a certain point, once the snow starts to go down, that they're going to find Paul's car. She just wants to kind of delay that. We're going to learn later. Well, you do in the book. You don't in the movie. But Annie has killed an adult man before. She killed him with an axe. And she threw his body in this lake bed And I think that once all the snow had melted, the body floated downstream. They never found who killed him. So Annie was never suspected because the body floated so far away. She wants something very similar to that to happen to the car. In the book, like we said before, there is no Buster or Virginia. So there's nobody really looking for Paul for a very, very long time. So once the snow starts to thaw, Annie really does take Paul's car and she moves it some miles away. I think she takes it up to like her laughing place. So there isn't really much that Annie isn't able to do in the book. She's really diabolical, really crafty. And part of me kind of felt like they kind of cut a lot of that from the movie because... Some of the stuff that Annie does in the book, it's almost too, like, fantastical to believe. Well, I think with the books, and it's the same thing with it, the books are horror. Whereas, like, the movie, they want to be like a psychological tour de force. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you, it feels like this time on, on Murder, She Wrote. Like a really dark episode of Murder, She Wrote. But not really even that dark. But this is my thing with the car, though. I feel like Annie in the book is very calculating. Even Paul talks about how astute she is. How she sees fucking everything. How she she doesn't miss anything. She thinks of everything. I just feel like Annie... I don't know, maybe it's not realistic in the book, but Annie wouldn't have just let them find Paul's car because then he crashed in the area, so now you know he's in the area, so now they're going to look for him in this area. I don't know. And so she rushes in to show Paul that she got the book. 
And so Paul's logical first question is, so the roads are open, right? You went out to buy a fucking book at a bookshop. I should be able to get to a hospital to fix my fucking legs, right? She says the ones leading to town. Okay. What does that even mean? Right. Annie, is the hospital not in town? What the fuck are you talking about? Get me somewhere to fix my fucking legs. She says that she also spoke to the orthopedic surgeon about Paul's legs. And allegedly, this orthopedic surgeon says that as long as Paul doesn't have any infections, he's good to stay where he is and they'll send an ambulance once the roads clear up. I was like, this sounds like bullshit. As she's saying it, I was like, that doesn't even sound believable. That sounds like the kind of stuff they they tell you before you like, let me speak to your supervisor. Right. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't, this is not real to me. This is imaginary. And I was like, I don't know if Paul's picking up on that because as she's saying, I was like, this just sounds stupid. So of course, Paul, because she's like, oh, I talked to an orthopedic surgeon. Paul's logical question is, oh, so the phones are working. And Annie says, well, mine aren't working, but the ones in town So you are. called the orthopedic surgeon in town instead of going to the hospital. She drove... To get that book. I to know. town on a road. Well, yeah, she went to get the book, but she drove on a road instead of driving him somewhere to get help. He's been in a very, very bad accident. If you called for help, they would airlift him out of there. If the roads weren't cleared, like when people get into car accidents in the mountains, they're not just like, well, as long as they don't have an infection, there's nothing we can do. No, they would come get him. You didn't do anything. And And you lied. And then it's like, this is what we mean by they're playing up this child. This sounds like some of my little niece like stories that she'll tell. Like you'd be like, well, you catch her in a story and then. Well, um, well, 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 I forgot. <laughs> That's how it sounds. I guess she wasn't expecting him to ask questions. Annie Wilkes in the movie is someone who has a mental deficiency in terms of like she's childlike. Whereas like Annie in the novel is evil. In every way. So she says she tried calling Paul's agent too. And I was just like, Annie is really, really lying through her teeth right now. Like, just straight up. And I was like, does Paul not recognize this? Because I was like, none of this sounds true. They airlift people all the time for stuff. But Paul is really mostly concerned with his daughter because this day is his daughter's birthday. And he is not there. And he's supposed to be. And so he knows that his daughter is going to be really concerned and really hurt. So Annie says, well, you're, I, when I talked to your agent, she said that she would tell your daughter that you're okay. How? You talked to my agent, though. The, the, this, I was like, this doesn't make any sense. This just sounds like a lie. But Paul isn't pressing her enough, in my opinion. But Annie is already kind of in, in a different like land at this point. She is just talking about this new book. He's like, it's my daughter's birthday. I'm missing my daughter's birthday. She's like, I just cannot wait to read this fucking book. She probably thinks I'm dead. Right. They they have to think that I'm dead. Does that not concern you at all? You bitch. And the cover of the book. I mean, just look at her right there. She's in her all white dress. And we're just all like, uh, hello. <laughs> Misery's child. I just love it. Right. So wait, this is a thing that I was talking about that deviates so wildly from the book. So Paul's in bed and then he hears someone coming through his door. It's a fucking pig. It's Annie's pig, Misery, named after his character, Misery Chastain. So she brings Misery into the room to meet Paul because she's like, I guess it's time that you meet Misery. And then she, you know, she's reiterating, I'm your number one fan. Look, I named my pig after your character. And 
I hate stuff like this in the movie because it makes her too likable. It makes her too likable to show that she cares for something. They show misery again a few times, trotting behind her, laying on her lap. And I'm like, what? why was this the choice? I guess they just wanted to make Annie more sympathetic. But I feel like that's not the story that was being told. I think that the reason why Annie is likable is because I don't think that they would have been able to sell the book. Like, sell the book as a movie because I don't think they think that people would want to see that because that would be too, it would be too much. I agree. I mean, yes, I agree. But then why make this story? And I guess it's like, I can't really shit on it that much because Kathy Bates won a fucking Academy Award for it. But why remake this story and water it down? Because it's a, it's a Stephen King book. It's a guaranteed hit. He has a million other ones. They have a lot of books to choose from from him. I guess I'm just like, you did the story a disservice. I, did you did you make her likable because it was Kathy Bates and you didn't want to make Kathy Bates too evil? Well, Kathy Bates wasn't Kathy Bates in this. No, she wasn't. She was like a little bit unknown. This made her Kathy Bates. Right. What I'm saying is I don't think that they felt like that book that story that character would make a good movie the way it really would have but i'm what i'm saying is the book was wildly popular they didn't have to completely sanitize it people went to see it because they wanted to see misery they knew the story already so they didn't have to sell it but you know people don't really read a Stephen King's bank account would differ <laughs> that some people do. Yeah, some people. There's there's people like us who read, but like some people are just like, oh, this is gonna be a new a new movie to go see. But they made it, and he was he turned into a fucking it's like spider at the end, and people ate that shit up. I think they could have sold Kathy Bates being mean. But they also took out some of the more fant- fantastical parts of it as well. Yes, they did take a lot out of it, but it is still, he still kills kids. It's just, I just feel like you didn't have to make her likable and you could have still had a story. It didn't have to be what she does. I mean, it's... Yes, I agree. It's too, at certain times in the book, it's too much. It's so crazy that it's, it starts to be unbelievable, the things that she does. But she's not, she doesn't have very many redeeming qualities. They're all fake. It's all sugary on the outside, but sour on the inside moments. In the movie, she clearly has a very sweet relationship with this pig. And it's like she has these little outbursts that are like, okay, yeah, until she, until she does something diabolical. And it's like, but the, it just makes that scene, which we're going to get to in a, in a bit, it just makes that scene almost kind of totally unbelievable. Because at, up until this point, she's been kind of whatever. She's been very petulant. Right. Okay, well, let's keep on. So, so far, she says that she's on page 300. And... She goes on to say that the, t- the two most divine things in the world are the Sistine Chapel and this book, Misery's Child. And I was like, Annie, somehow I feel like that's not true. <laughs> but this is, but wait, then she does this thing where she starts snorting like a pig <laughs> and running around the room with her pig. And I was like, that's really Why fucking weird. They- what the fuck are you doing, Annie? Why did they do that? Why'd they add that? I don't know. I am not a fan. I'm not a fan just because I I know what she's like in the book. But let's continue so we don't get bogged down. 
After some time, Annie comes into Paul's room again, and she's she's like, I only have two more chapters left to go, but she can already tell that this is going to be a book that as soon as she's done, she's going to start it over, reread it again. Now, we know as the audience that Paul was tired of writing this character. We as the audience know that Misery is about to die in this book. So we're just kind of all watching this unfold and watching Annie kind of get to this point in this book. We can, I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist. Paul should have been prepared for this to know that Annie was going to be a little upset. So she opens up to him a little bit and she says that she rereads all of his books because they saved her when she was upset about her husband leaving her. She said that the misery books brought her joy and comfort during a dark time in her life. Then later, in the middle of the night, as Paul is sleeping, he hears Annie come into his room and she is pissed. She is screaming at him. She's calling him a dirty bird. And she's asking him, how could you? Because she's just finished the book only to find that Misery's character dies at the end. She dies during childbirth. And Paul's like, I mean, Annie, that was really like common during that time. And he's like, the important thing is that Misery's spirit lives on. And Annie said, fuck that. She didn't, but that's what she meant. She's come completely unglued at this point, and she starts screaming at the top of her lungs that she doesn't want misery spirit. She wants misery. And then she starts to pick up and slam the bed that Paul is laying in, causing him to be in a tremendous amount of pain, obviously. And she tells Paul that he murdered misery And he corrects her by saying, I didn't murder her. She just slipped away. Annie cannot accept this. She refuses. She like slipped away. No. So she is totally insane at this point. And so she picks up a small table and she holds it over Paul as if she's going to hit him with it. And she ends up slamming it against the wall above his head, which book Paul would have never been so lucky because she definitely would have beat Paul with that table in the book. But she spares Paul this time, but she's still very hurt. And she tells him, I thought you were good, Paul, but you're not good. You're just another lying old dirty bird. And I don't think I better be around you for a while. So she then walks out of the room. But she, before she does, she turns around and she calmly tells him, don't even think about anybody coming for you because I didn't call a single person to tell them that you're here. Not a doctor, not your daughter, not your agent. Nobody knows that you're here. She says, you better hope that nothing happens to me because if I die, you're going to die too. And that's when Annie leaves the house, she exits, she leaves him totally alone. What kind of exposition dump was that? <laughs> that she didn't call anybody? It's just like, all of this is going to come out right now. It was like, shouldn't, shouldn't we have like, slowly? Right. Okay, so Annie leaves Ball and she does this a few times in the book. These are really desperate times for Paul because when Annie leaves, she just leaves. She locks him in the room. She leaves him no pain medicine. She leaves him no food, no water. Specifically in the book, they make it a really big deal because he really needs that medicine. One, because of the pain, but then also because, again, he's addicted to it, which they totally cut out. So initially, when he makes the decision to try to pull himself out of his bed and leave the room, it's because he needed that medicine so badly. It was driving him so much. So he manages to hit the floor, throw himself out of the bed. You can tell he's just in an excruciating amount of pain. His feet and legs are so gnarled and crazy looking. 
Um, but he does manage to pull himself over to his bedroom door only to find that she's locked it from the outside. So he can't escape. So she ends up finding him on the floor like the next day. So we cut to a scene at the police station the next day. So we get another scene with Buster and he's checking in with Mrs. Sewell, Paul's agent, but he has no updates on Paul. They're still looking. So they did check, I think his card records and his um, call records from the hotel. He didn't make any strange calls. He didn't buy anything strange. So they don't have any leads there. So back at Annie's house, when she arrives home and finds Paul on the floor, she's very, very apologetic, and she puts him back into his bed. And she seems to have completely 180'd since she's been gone. And in this moment, again, she's just acting as sweet as can be. She tells Paul that she has a surprise for him, but he has to do something for her first. So she starts telling Paul that while she was gone, you know, she was thinking and she's like, sometimes her thinking can get a little muddy. And then she just like straight casually drops that this is why she couldn't remember all the things they were asking her on the witness stand in Denver. And Paul's like, excuse me? (laughs) But she just kind of really brushes past that. But she also says that She said she asked God about him and she says that God told her that he delivered Paul to her so that she could show him the way. She then exits and comes back in with a fucking barbecue grill. In it are Paul's satchel (laughs) with his newly finished manuscript, some lighter fluid and some matches. She then douses the manuscript with lighter fluid. And she tells Paul that he has to burn it to rid the world of that filth. So Paul tries to bluff and he's acting super calm. And he's saying that his editor has already made dozens of copies of that book in New York. So she really isn't ridding the world of anything. And Annie's like, Great, then it shouldn't be any problem for you to just light this bitch on fire then, right? And he tries to reiterate to her, like, Annie, it's really no big deal. And Annie's like, look, you you silly idiot. I'm your biggest fan, remember? I know that you never make more than one copy of your book out of superstition. And this is since you wrote your first book. You told Merv Griffin that story 11 years ago. Did you expect that me, of all people, wouldn't know that? Now light the shit on fire. So Paul is really hurt, right? Because this was supposed to be his first post-misery book. It's his attempt at some serious writing. So he tries to offer her alternatives to burning it. She, he asks her if he could just keep it for himself. But Annie really isn't having it. But this is what's so crazy about it burning. Why is that normal to her? Couldn't she just throw it away? Why is this the solution that she chose? Yeah... I think that she did it because she really wanted to hurt Paul. In the book, this scene is a little bit more drug out. She actually makes him burn like one page at a time for a minute just to really drive home that he's like burning this work that he spent so long working on. And then she sets the whole thing on fire. Because of the way that they wrote her character for the movie, it all just seems so silly. It doesn't seem really mean. She's talking about God and she's talking about like he has to rid the world of this filth. In the book, the scene, it's like she's she's really diabolical. She's really kind of straight evil. And so it just it comes off a little stronger in the book because you can tell that she's just like really trying to hurt him. 
But the same thing happens in the book that happens in the movie. Once they set the whole stack on fire, the fire kind of gets a little bit out of control. And it really scares her because like fiery paper starts flying all around the room. And Paul is really happy to see her scared. He loves seeing that look on her face. You know, it's crazy, but in like, I don't know if we brought this up, but like in the movie, when he's just like hesitant to light the match, she's dousing his bed with gasoline. Oh, you're right. She is doing that. Yeah, she starts dousing his um, legs, like the blanket that's covering his legs with the lighter fluid. I guess kind of scaring him like well if you don't light that on fire i'm gonna light you on fire essentially paul is starting to get the hint that annie cannot be reasoned with and he lights the match and he throws it on the manuscript and it erupts in flames just then they both hear a helicopter flying overhead it's buster and a state police officer and they're doing an aerial search for paul and they actually fly right over the Wilkes residence. But because they don't see Paul's car, they just kind of turn around and leave. So now that the book is burned, Annie gives him his pain medicine, which she would have been withholding for a while because she left uh, the Novaral. But instead of taking them, Paul puts the pills under his mattress. This is such a deviation from the book. Um, because in the book, there's no way that he could have gone this long without taking those pills. It would have been physically impossible for him to. With his dinner, she gives Paul two more nov- Novarol. But he ends up taking his fork and he cuts the fabric on his mattress and he hides the Novarol there. So he's kind of stockpiling them. The next day, Annie surprises him with a wheelchair And she's also set up a workstation for him with a little table and an old typewriter that she got that is missing the letter N. So she tells him that he is going to write a brand new book called Misery's Return because misery can't be dead. So Paul has to make it right. And it will be a book in her honor for saving his life and nursing him back to health. And Paul's like, do you expect me to just whip up a new novel in a situation as fucked up as this one? And she tells him she's expecting nothing short of a masterpiece. She's nuts. <laughs> she is nuts. The movie's kick- it's kicking the high gear now. It is. this. Yes, yeah, so this is the point where she actually starts to physically hurt Paul. So as she exits the room to get his paper, she brings it in. It's caressable bond paper, which is the most expensive paper that they sold. As she's doing all this, he notices that one of her bobby pins is lying on the floor. And he makes a mental note of of this. So in this moment, Annie is being just as sweet as can be. And Paul is really trying to keep her that way because clearly she is mentally unstable. So when she asks, did I do good? He said, you did great. And she's overjoyed, except then he tells her that he can't work on Caraspal Bond paper because it smudges so badly. He asks if when she goes back into town, can she please buy him some different paper? Annie is super crestfallen, to say the least, because she says, but mine costs the most. So she doesn't see how it can smudge. And so he shows her, he types out a word on the typewriter and he wipes his finger across it. And it's super clear that it smudges. Even she wipes her finger across it and it smudges really badly. So... Paul is trying his best to keep her calm. So he says, I just really want you to be involved in everything along the way. He really wants the project to come out perfectly. But Annie is not really impressed. So she's actually extremely offended that Paul wouldn't accept the paper that she got. And so she switches on a dime. 
And so she's she starts saying stuff like, if you want, I can bring you back the whole store. Uh, basically, like, since you got your degree and you know every fucking thing. Like, she's super bothered by this. It was very degree and knowing everything. And it's just like, well, the paper does smudge. Yes. And you saw that, Annie. So he's not lying to her. It is very smudgeable paper. I don't know why she got so upset and talking about buying the store. You watched it smudge. You weirdo. Because that's just what she's like. But I mean, I guess I'm trying to rationalize somebody who's insane. Right. She is in her like self not rational at all. So Paul, who's also tr- can't understand why she's freaking out so bad. So Paul is like, Annie, what the fuck is wrong? I just want paper that doesn't smudge. She loses it. And she says she does everything for Paul. She cleans him. She dresses him. She gets him the most expensive paper. And all he can do is tell her it's the wrong kind of paper. And just, like, she didn't do a good job. He makes her feel bad. So she says she'll get his paper. But he better start showing her a little bit more appreciation. And then she takes this heavy-ass box of Craspel Bond paper, and she slams it on his knees. And I was like, if he didn't like Craspel Bond before, he definitely doesn't like it now. He'll never buy that paper again in his entire life. She fucks his knees up. I can't believe she was so... Well, I guess I can't. It's just like, she was so mad. It's... But that's just how she is. She'll just, like, flip on a dime. Yeah, it's our first time in the movie seeing how just freaking nuts she is. Right, right. So he is in agony, and she doesn't leave him with any medicine, and she storms out and locks the door to his room. So this situation is very similar to the book In the book, he leaves this room almost specifically because she slam in the book, she slams her fists on his knee and then she leaves. She doesn't give him any pain medicine and his his need for the pain medicine is so great. It's what initially pushes him to use the bobby pin to pick the lock on his bedroom door to leave the room But he does this in the movie. He leaves the bedroom. He tries to open the front door, but it's a deadbolt that needs a key. So there's no picking that. So he heads into the living room where he spots a phone. He rushes to it and he tries to use it. But then he realizes that it's like a fake phone for decoration. Did she do that just because he was there? Or did she always have that kind of phone just in her house. I think maybe she just doesn't use the phone. She doesn't have it. I guess she doesn't have anybody who's going to call her. She doesn't work. No, so this is the thing that we learn about Annie. Um they don't do they don't do nearly a good enough job at showing it in this movie, but they go a little bit into depth with it in the book. Annie is a murderer. She's always been a murderer. She's murdered a lot of people. We know this because she has a scrapbook, which we're going to find in a little bit. But in this scrapbook, she keeps all the newspaper clippings from like the obituaries of the people that she's killed, newspaper articles about uh, people that have died. She was a, the head nurse in a infant ward a maternity ward at a hospital and a lot of babies died and they wrote about it in the newspaper. She keeps that. She ends up getting charged for that. She ends up getting charged. She has to go to court. She doesn't, there's not enough evidence to convict her, but everybody believes that she did that. They just kind of don't think that there was enough evidence, but they call her the dragon lady. The things that she said on the stand were really crazy So with that being said, people don't like Annie. She doesn't have any friends. She was married once, but they got divorced in the movie. They say that I think the reason for divorce was like 
mental anguish or something. Her husband filed divorce from her. So she wouldn't use the phone, right? Because who would she call? And if she wanted to talk to anybody, she would just go into town. Yeah, but so as Paul is rolling around, he's going to the living room and she has bars on the windows. He's wheeling around, really trying to figure out what to do. And he almost knocks over this small glass penguin figurine that Annie has on a table in her living room. And he catches it so it doesn't break. But we as the audience can see, just because of the way the camera is zoomed in, it's a table full of different animal figurines. They're all facing the same way. But Paul puts the figurine facing back the wrong way. Which it's like, Paul, because of the situation that you're in, this is like a rookie mistake. Because it, it, to me, it's very clear that you've placed this in the wrong spot. You didn't even try. And she's so crazy that I would really try to avoid capturing her attention in any way. Because you know that you're not supposed to be out of your room. So while all of this is happening, we as the audience see that Annie's gotten the paper from the store and she's on her way back home. So the pressure is on. When we cut back to Paul, he is still wheeling around and he notices that Annie has a framed picture of him on a table. It's like a little shrine and she has all the misery books lined up on each side of his picture. And so he's like, mm, that's a little weird, but he rolls into the bathroom and it's in here that you can see that she has a ton of medicine. She has a lot of the Novoral as well, the codeine medicine that he's been taking. So he steals some and he shoves it down his pants. This scene was a much bigger deal in the book because this was him assuring that she didn't have that power over him anymore because remember he's addicted to it and she withholds it as a form of torturing him. So him getting it in the book, one, because she smashed his knee, but two, he wants to have it in the future for when she takes these like trips again where she'll just like leave him for days on end. So... He then rolls to the kitchen and he sees the back door and he tries to get to it, but the doorway to the kitchen is a lot smaller, so he can't fit his chair through it. So he tries to force it, but when that doesn't work, he has to climb out of his chair and crawl to try to open the back door. When he gets to the back door, of course it's locked, because why fucking wouldn't it be? And you can see the deadbolt on the kitchen door, just like the front door. So since he can't open it, he decides to sit and take a little breather. But just then he can hear Annie's car approaching the house. So now he has to frantically try to get back to his chair and get back into his room. And he's cutting it really close because he has all kinds of doors open and stuff just stuff he has to close he has to use the bobby pin to relock the door he rolls into his room literally right before she walks in it's very tense to watch it was tense it's one of the more tense scenes in the movie but in this moment he sees that that pack of novarol is sticking out of the top of his pants so he hurries and he covers it up with his hands, but he's dripping sweat and he looks really haggard. So Annie's like, what the hell have you been doing? You look awful. And he plays it really cool. And this is when he says that he's been suffering and he just really, really needs his pills. And she is, she tries to say, well, let me get you back into bed and then I'll give you your medicine. And he says, no, you know, don't do that. Because if she does, surely she's going to see the Novoral sticking up out of his pants. So he puts on this act. I mean, he's really begging her, please just give me my medicine first. And she looks at him for a good long minute before saying, it breaks my heart to see you like this, <laughs> which is like pretty ironic. But she leaves to go get the medicine and Paul just shoves the pills deeper into his pants. So when she comes back in, she gives him the Novoral 
And she is saying she did a lot of thinking on the drive home. And she's determined that the reason that she's never been more popular is because of her temper. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. I mean, how self-aware. Finally, yes. Right. Good for Annie. At least she knows. And then she's like, it's just so much like a kid. She's like, tell me the truth. Are you mad at me? And Paul, who knows that Annie is volatile as fuck, he just says, who doesn't let off a little steam every once in a while? Because he's really trying to keep her happy so she doesn't crush his already liquefied kneecaps again. So Annie loads him into bed and she gives him a pencil and a pad in case he thinks of any ideas. And when he says she shouldn't expect much, She says, think of me as your inspiration. And Paul is probably trying to fight the urge to throw up (laughs) right now. But then on her way out, Annie does the most unhinged thing I think that she's done in the movie thus far. And she's almost out the door and she says, (laughs) she says, catch this. And she blows him the biggest, sloppiest, craziest, most comical air kiss ever put to screen and then paul who's dying inside has to pretend to catch it it's so fucking uncomfortable i was so i was like curling my toes because i was like oh my god this is cringe as fuck why are you so unaware and so it seems like this that are like oh annie she's just like right. a fucking weirdo is mentally a child. Right. <laughs> right. But wait, there's a scene coming up that's so funny to me. When you talk about unaware. Oh. So after she leaves, we see Paul spit out the Novarol that she given him and he hides it in his mattress. So he's just like stockpiling them. So now we cut back to Sheriff Buster who is doing yet another aerial sweep of the area, and this time he does see Paul's car flipped over and buried in the snow. So they pull it out, and having not found Paul inside, the state police make an announcement on the news that Paul is assumed dead at this point. They think that he climbed out of his vehicle after the crash and that his body is now buried somewhere in the snow and that they'll probably find it once the snow starts to thaw in spring. And that's all we got to say. We don't really care. <laughs> they don't care. I mean, they that they really wash their hands of it. They don't even think they inspect the car because had they, they would notice, just like Buster in Virginia, that... The car door has some really deep, distinct pry marks on it. They're the ones that Annie left when she was crowbarring her way into Paul's car to save him. So they don't agree with the assumption that Paul just crawled off and died somewhere. They don't believe that Paul exited the car on his own. They think someone pulled him out. So back at Annie's house, we see Paul using a piece of paper from his notepad to make a makeshift pouch, and he's filling it with powder from a bunch of the Novarol pills that he's been saving. Next, we cut to him sitting at his writing desk, and he's trying to come up with more story for the Misery Returns book, and that's when Annie walks in. Paul's giving her the first chapter to read of Misery's Return, and Annie says it's trash. He needs to rewrite it. And Paul is really taken aback because he's like, um, bitch, I'm the writer here. And I guess he thought that Annie would just eat up anything that he produced because in this situation, and I hate to say it, she's right. She makes some really valid points here. I know. I hated that. (laughs) I know because you don't want to agree with her, but you have to. So Paul is tasked with bringing Misery back from the dead, right? Because he straight up killed her character in the last book. Killed her and buried her. There really aren't any ifs, ands, or buts. And so what Paul is writing, Annie says that it's not fair. So what she means by that, she gives an example. 
she compares it to these old chapter shows that she used to go to as a kid where each week they would show just like a new segment of the story. And she said one of the chapter shows, Rocket Man, it was her favorite. She says that one week she went to see it and the bad guy had loaded Rocket Man into a car that had no brakes. He'd knocked him unconscious and he'd welded the door shut and sent him speeding down a mountain road to barrel off a cliff. Rocket Man wakes up and while he is barreling down this mountain, he tries a steering wheel, doesn't work, tries the brakes, doesn't work, and he tries to get out and he can't because the doors are welded shut. He couldn't do it before the car goes off the mountain cliff and crashes at the bottom and burns. Now, Annie was, of course, upset that Rocket Man was in this crash, but because it's a chapter show titled Rocket Man, she knows that the next week he's going to come back. So she's very, very excited to see what's going to happen in the next installment. How is he going to get out of that car? So she was the first in line next week. She says the beginning of each episode, they show the ending of the last one. So as she's watching Rocket Man headed toward the cliff in his welded shut car, at the very last minute, he's actually able to jump free before the car plummets to the bottom and explodes. Now, she is super worked up telling the story. So you can only imagine how she must have reacted when it was actually happening in the movie theater. Scaring the other children? Yes, very much so. She doesn't get into this part in the movie, but in the book, so she used to go to these chapter shows with her brother, who's also named Paul. And she makes such a scene in the movie theater that her brother is trying to tell her to be quiet and she won't because she's been crazy her whole life, apparently. But they actually, the attendant comes and actually kicks her out of the movie theater because she's being so disruptive. She just says that she felt cheated because she's like, that isn't really what happened the week before. She knows he didn't escape the car. She watched it. And so she just gets up and she starts screaming in the movie theater. He did not get out of the cock a car. And she's like, are you all blind? Do you have amnesia? And so she just says that that result was not fair. And so when Paul says, well, they often did stuff like that in the chapter shows, she's like, yeah, I know they did. But Paul, you're better than that. You know, she's like, you're you writing the same way. It's cheap. And Paul had written in his chapter that misery was brought back to life because the doctors gave her this like experimental blood transfusion. But Annie's like, I cannot accept that because at the end of the last book, Paul made it very clear that the doctor never got there. He couldn't have because the character that was in charge of fetching the doctor never made it. And so misery was ultimately buried in the ground at the end. That's where Paul has to start the new story. And he's pissy, but he really can't deny that she's right. She's made a very valid point. So now we cut to some time later and he's written a new chapter and he's reading it and he asks her, is it fair? Should I continue? And she's like, you fucking better because the shit is apparently bomb. She didn't use those exact words, but something along those lines. So essentially misery was accidentally buried alive as the result of a bee sting that put her in a temporary coma and the same thing had happened to another woman in the area 30 years earlier. It turned out that woman was like her long lost mom. And so it's a lot in the book. A, a large portion of the book is you get Annie's and Paul's story, but you also do get these bits and pieces of the misery book too, peppered throughout. Sometimes there's like whole sections of it. So they go into a lot of detail of the misery story in the book, but um, that bee sting thing, Annie actually gave him that idea for the bee sting. They don't mention that in this one. I don't know why, but she's really excited that he uses the, the bee sting ang angle. 
So anyway, Annie is really giddy that Misery is still alive. She's overcome with joy. She's bouncing around like a little girl. She finds it all so romantic and she's really inspired. So she goes to put on her Liberace records. Um, and she says she's going to play him all day. He's her favorite. This whole thing in general, the way that she's reacting to the novel, when I say she's bouncing around the room, she really is like bouncing around the room. She's like hopping. She's going to put on these records because they're her favorite. All of this is making her too sympathetic for my liking. It's like a child. It's, and it's like, I'm just this old lady and... You know, at, at the court, if I just had love or if I just had someone to talk to, I would probably be better off. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's right. how it comes. Like, when it's just exactly. like, y'all, she's nuts. <laughs> right. And I hate scenes like this because, the, so they have, okay, so let's get to the next scene because this is another scene that really stands out. So as she's running to put the Liberace records on, Paul asks Annie to have dinner with him that night to celebrate Misery's return. And he says he couldn't have done it without her. And to Annie, who is in her mind already picturing their wedding photos together, she's like, of course I'll have dinner with you. So this, I would just like to note that this dinner thing, this entire thing never happens in the book. It's, it's super silly in the movie to me. But back at the sheriff's office, Buster has bought a bunch of Paul Sheldon books to read up on his missing person, which is... So weird. That was so strange. It's so weird. I don't know why they added this. And they had this part with his wife, and she's like, I guess your little mistress, she liked to read, huh? And he was like, girl, I ain't got no energy for no other girl. We talk about. Also... You know, they were driving, and she was touching his leg, and he was like, we're in this car, you're my deputy, not my wife. I was just like, yeah. this is weird. <laughs> well, their entire storyline is weird. Their addition to the story is very weird. I think that they're supposed to seem really endearing. You're making it sound like he doesn't like her. I feel like it's he really No, weird. okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, y'all. He do like her, but it's just funny because it's just like, what is the reason for... It's so removed. I haven't seen something so removed from a story since since Casey Becker. Right. Well, it's like this B-plot is very, very B-plot. Like, it doesn't... Because ultimately, yes, Buster ties into Annie and Paul's story, but they... Virginia and Buster don't tie in you know what i mean like it these two worlds never meet so this b plot is just really fucking extra to me they're cute and i like it i think i like buster and virginia as characters you know i just wish that they'd been in like fucking fargo or something not not this movie so he has these cute little exchanges with virginia they really i think want you to like buster and virginia for a reason but we cut to the the dinner with annie and paul and annie is dressed in her sunday's best she has her hair in curls she has her makeup done and she's in such a great mood she's being as sweet as can be she made them dinner she made them meatloaf which paul was like shitting on her meatloaf but i actually really like meatloaf you like the meatloaf she made well no so let's get into it Paul asks her, he's like, mm, this is good. You know, like, what what the hell is in this? And she's like, well, I only use fresh tomatoes in my meatloaf, never canned. And I also mix in some fucking spam. Do you know I would have punched her dead in her face? <laughs> I, I was like, Amy, right what the face. fuck? <laughs> I don't know what I thought she was about to say, but it definitely wasn't fucking spam. She served some spam for breakfast the earlier. Don't serve me no spam. She did do that. I don't eat that. But what I think they're trying to show is that Annie is a country bumpkin, right? Because Paul, I don't know if we mentioned it, but Paul is from New York. He's a, and he says that like growing up, he was like a kid from the slum. Like he grew up in a real city. And Annie is a farm girl. 
she has a pig and she eats spam. Bong and- girl, bong girl, yawn girl. Don't you ever give me no spam, girl. Well, she thinks it's normal. So he's like, mm, can't get that in a diner in New York City. <laughs> So wait, then they're drinking this fucking jug of wine. You know that was nasty. You... What vintage is this? It's a literal jug. <laughs> it's it's Welch's. What are you talking about? I'm not trying to shit on anybody because I know we all have different tastes. But they're drinking out of this jug of wine. And she just, she's so happy in this moment that it almost makes you feel really sorry for her, right? Well, that and what it does is it makes you feel like, okay, this is this is gonna crash. What what's what's gonna ha- what's gonna make it crash is all I could think. I get what you mean. We've already seen that her mood swings are really quick and they're really like it's completely one eighty. So she it's if she's this happy at any moment, she's gonna be really, really, really bad. And it's it's like the happier she is, the harder she comes crashing. Right. So she pours the two glasses of wine and Paul distracts her by sending her to get a candle to make this like a candle lit dinner. And he's really trying to like riz her up. And I was I didn't like that. But I hate that I didn't like it because I shouldn't care because I shouldn't care about Annie, but they're making me care about her too much. Cuz I felt like Paul was being a real piece of shit. Especially cuz he's trying to drug her. <laughs> right. So as soon as she he sends her off to get a candle for the table, he pours all that Novarol powder that he's been collecting into her wine it is a shit ton it would have killed her it's a codeine based pill so like i said none of this happens in the book but there are times where he thinks about giving her the novarol he thinks about like maybe i can do this but he determines that he can't because he's like novarol is extremely bitter he's like she'd know right away and she would hurt me really badly so they put this in here, and I guess I'm like, at the end of the day, I was kind of like, why did they put it in here? Because as they're, like, she comes back with the candle, he's complimenting her decorating skills, really trying to put her at ease, knowing this house looks <laughs> a shitty mess. <laughs> you know it's stink. So, it's so packed with so much fucking knickknacks. So... But he's trying to ease her, and so he Annie comes and she goes to to celebrate the toast. But she like knocks over the candle, and wh- when she's trying to catch it, she spills the entire glass of wine on the table, and with it all the Novarol. I know he wanted to die. The look on his face looks like he wanted to die. I gotta eat the spam too, and now he has to finish the whole fucking spam dinner. He's in a hell of his own making do you know how mad i would have do you understand after he spilled that wine he was like i wish i would have gave it to my damn self you stupid stupid klutz he was very very upset and then it's like you feel bad for her because she's like oh my gosh i'm so sorry i ruined your toast she's like let me pour another glass and let's just pretend it didn't happen and then she's like to misery and he toasts her, but she just looks so happy and so innocent in this m- moment that, you know, I guess it's like I'm I'm irritated because it's like I know how she's supposed to be in the book. But I guess, you know, like give it up for the director because if he was trying to make you sympathetic towards her, he did a really good fucking job because I just she's so happy and he's trying to kill her. Well, it's just this thing where it's just like, they're trying to make it like she just needs to be loved. You know, she's just, girl, right. I don't know if it's just like the reason why you play her up like, oh, well, she's kind of like heavy set, So she's like country and like big, you know, and like she puts spam and meatloaf and, you know, all Drink this stuff. Wine. She has a pig for, for a pet. It's just like, oh, man, look at her miserable life. It would have just been so easy if she would have just drunk the goddamn wine. 
it would have been easy, too easy, and it would have saved him, Paul, a lot of heartache because it only goes downhill from here. <laughs> yes, but besides being a captive, you know, we get this time passing little montage and Paul appears, you know, everything appears to be going really well. He's writing up a storm and Annie's reading his chapter and he gets through like 30 chapters of the book. But also during this montage, you get these little shots. He's using his typewriter as a weight so he can, so he's getting stronger. And then one rainy night, it's storming. Annie comes in to bring him his pills and she is looking really really rough she's in a bathrobe she has this like miserable distant look on her face and when Paul asks her what's wrong she says sometimes the rain gives her the blues but then she proceeds to tell him that when he first got there she only loved the writer part of Paul Sheldon but now she knows she loves the rest of him too but she knows he doesn't love her back because he's this famous guy. And she says she's not the movie star type. And she also tells him that he will never know the fear of losing someone like him if you're someone like her, which is sad. I just didn't like how sad that was. And so Paul asks her, why would you lose me? Paul, Shut the fuck up. So she says the book is almost finished and his legs are almost healed and soon he'll want to leave. And Paul lies and tells her that he likes it there. So why would he want to leave? And Annie's like, stop playing in my fucking face. Okay. Because at this point, you know, that's a damn lie. And she's sick of it. And I'm sick of it too. We he could just say, well, I can always visit. Right. You could have said, we can always be friends, Annie. I'll never forget what you did for me. Like, he's just, like, really playing in her face. I didn't like it because, Paul, be realistic. Like, be fucking for real right now. You gotta go back to your daughter. Yeah, you you don't want to live here on this farm with me. And that makes me sad. And I, you know, it's like, I, I'm entitled to feel sad right now. But don't act like I'm stupid. I never leave you. What are you talking about? Shut the fuck up. So this scene doesn't happen in the book, but they just, they want you to feel so bad for Annie. They want you to be like, oh, right now, because she's just hurting because she knows that she's in love with this man that doesn't love her back. But just like out of fucking nowhere, she just pulls a gun out of her robe pocket. And she says sometimes she thinks about using it. And then she goes, I might put bullets in it. And then she walks, just walks straight out of his room, out of the house with the gun and drives off. So (laughs) Paul uses this as an opportunity to leave his room again. And he goes and he grabs a knife. Which, fair. Because that was kind of, that was a lot. You know, like she's kind of raising the stakes here by whipping out this gun on you. So he grabs a knife. He hides it in his sling. As he's rolling back, he notices an open scrapbook with newspaper clippings about him sitting on her table. So he goes and he picks up the scrapbook. And as he's flipping through it, that's when he starts to notice that there's a lot of death notices, a lot of obituaries, a lot of newspaper articles about suspicious deaths about babies suspiciously dying in the hospital where Annie works. And this is how he figures out that Annie is an actual murderer. So Annie murdered these babies. Annie murdered her father, um, which is like, they can't prove these things. There was another guy that was there earlier that they found his body. She murdered him. And so she actually got arrested. She was charged with the, the babies suspiciously dying but they couldn't prove it so this kind of clues paul in on exactly how dangerous annie really is so later that night paul's lying in his bed and he has the knife in his sling and he's kind of practicing what he's gonna do when annie comes in just like whip it out and stab her but annie doesn't 
end up coming back for a while. So he takes a knife and he shoves it under his mattress. But then later that night, Annie does come back and he wakes up and he sees her standing over him in his room. She ends up giving him an injection before he can stop her. And so he's out. And so when he finally wakes up, it's the next day. And Annie has him strapped to his bed. He is tied down. And she tells him that she knows that he's been out of his room. She knows this because her ceramic penguin always faces south, but he was turned the wrong way. And he says, I don't know what you mean. And she, he tries to reach for the knife that he'd hid under the mattress But Annie pulls the knife out from her dress pocket. So Paul knows that he's fucked right now. In the book, the way that she finds out that Paul has been leaving his room is because she'd watched like an old detective show that would hang really thin pieces of thread along drawers or something to figure out if somebody was stealing from you. So if the thread was broken, you knew that somebody had been in your stuff. Annie does something very similar to this. She puts thread like across her scrapbook to see if he would open it. She puts thread like across, I guess, like different drawers or doors or things. But that's how she knows for sure that Paul has been leaving his room. And so it was a really kind of diabolical, really clever thing that she did. So she makes up her mind. She's like, I think that you've left your room seven times. And she's like, whether it's seven times or 70 times, she's like, it it doesn't matter. You've left your room. In the movie, she tells him she knows that he's been out of the room twice. And she also was like, I couldn't figure out how you were doing it. And so she... So she looked around and she ended up finding the bobby pin that he'd been using to open the door. And she says, it's okay, though, because she believes that with time, he's going to come to accept being there with her. And then this is where things just, like, really go left. Yes. This is the most shocking part of the movie. Um, It's, you know, obviously the the most shocking part of the book as well. But uh, so she asked Paul, which... Is very eerie as we know what happens, but I'm sure very random to him. She says, do you know anything about the early days of the Kimberly Diamond Mines? Specifically, what they did to the native workers who stole diamonds and tried to run away. And so he's like, okay, they killed them. And she's like, no, obviously they didn't do that because they needed them to keep mining the diamonds. So she says they didn't kill them, but they they wanted them to keep working and not be able to run away. So they did an operation that they called the hobbling. (laughs) Y'all. Annie then reaches down and she pulls out this big piece of wood that she wedges in between both of Paul's ankles. She then picks up this big fucking sledgehammer and Paul is begging Annie to not do whatever it is she's thinking about doing. But Annie just shushes him. She's like, shush, my darling. And she tells him to trust her. She then takes the sledgehammer and she brutally hammers Paul's ankle against the the piece of wood. And it, I mean, it turns his ankle into fucking liquid. I mean, his foot is... Uh, t- turns i mean like the, the penguin was, was facing due south his foot is facing fucking due south it's crazy and so then she walks to the other side and she does the same thing to that ankle i mean his ankles are fucking liquefied so as he is writhing in pain she just looks at him and she says god i love you it's crazy it's a lot the hobbling is very different in the book than it is in the movie because <laughs> yeah. in the book, and I do think that maybe they felt like this would have been a little too ridiculous to put in the movie. 
it is a part that almost takes you out of the book because in the book, she doesn't use a sledgehammer. Instead, she comes into his room. She gives him the injection. They had the whole exchange about him being out of his room. But she uses an axe and she ends up completely cutting Paul's foot off, just totally severing it with two blows of the axe. Because he's bleeding so profusely, she can't tourniquet the wound because there's no major vein there. And she's like, I don't have time to like stitch it or anything. So she's like, the only thing that I can do is cauterize it. And so she also has a fucking blow torch. <laughs> And so she blow torches the bloody stump where his foot used to be. It's a really, really horrific scene. And Paul ends up passing out. He almost dies from this because obviously a combination of the shock and the blood loss. But she's able to bring him back. Yeah, now he's fucking footless. So that's a thing. <laughs> Put loose. Literally. So after some time, we get a scene where Annie is outside and she's taking care of her beloved little pig, Misery. And when Paul looks at her through his window from his wheelchair with his severely broken liquid ankles wrapped up, she waves to him and she calls out, Hi, pumpkin! And he gives her the finger. finger. And she just laughs this off and she calls him a big kidder. Which was strange, huh? I thought that was very, very weird. I thought it was a super weird scene. Because as volatile as Annie is, the Paul in the book would never dream of doing something like that. Because one, Annie hates profanity, right? Right. So that would have... That set her off on itself but you're also giving her the finger which is like really disrespectful towards her she wouldn't have react that way she wouldn't have been, thought you were kidding like she's very childlike but at the same time she's a murderer but okay so we cut back to sheriff buster's story the outside of his windows he sees a crazy annie driving through town and she almost t-bones this guy and they kind of scream at each other and she calls him a cock a -doody. And seeing how crazy she is reminds him like, oh yeah, Annie Wilkes is also a murderer. Because the whole <laughs> town knows that she was oh, like, yeah. charged with these crimes. Yeah. Like they should have questioned her first. Questioned the murderer in the town. So... He goes to the library's archives and he pulls up all the newspaper articles about Annie that were written when she was arrested for killing those infants when she was a nurse. So at the time, when asked to give a statement by the reporters, Annie told them, quote, there is a justice higher than that of man. I will be judged by him, which is a line directly from one of the misery books and Sheriff Buster remembers that line well because it also stood out to him because, remember, he bought all of Paul Sheldon's books to read, and he really liked that line. So now this gets him thinking that Annie may be involved in Paul's disappearance because if Annie is the one that pried him out of the car, knowing how crazy Annie is, knowing that she's, like, really into Paul Sheldon, he's like, I wonder if she could be holding him, which is like kind of a huge leap in deductive reasoning, right? Like I, I'm not sure that I would have connected those dots, but I guess they have to for the sake of the movie. Like I said, murder, murder she wrote. This is definitely how murder she wrote episode goes. Yeah. Yeah. Because this was like a pretty fantastical thing. Like he's like watching from the window and then just so happens to remember this obscure line that she quoted. I don't know. It's a lot. But he ends up going to the bookstore and he asks if Annie Wilkes bought Paul Sheldon's latest book. And the store manager's like, ugh, Annie Wilkes has never missed getting the first copy of a Paul Sheldon book ever. Anytime something re is released, Annie's going to be in here. So the sheriff is like, mm, yes, interesting, interesting. So Sheriff Buster asks the clerk if Annie has been buying anything strange lately. 
And the clerk says, well, no, she just bought some paper, like typing paper. So now the sheriff is on a mission because I guess in his mind, he's like, okay, yeah, she must be holding Paul Sheldon hostage and making him write a book. I don't know how he made, how he come, came to that conclusion, but he's going straight to Annie's house alone. And no one knows he's going there. No, not even fucking Virginia. So Paul can see him coming up the road out of his window. But just then, before he even has time to react, and he barges into his room and injects him with something. He grabs her and he tries to strangle her. But whatever she injected him with starts working really quickly and he loses control. And she gets mad at him for fighting her because she thinks that he's being like pretty ungrateful. She does take care of him 24 seven. And she's like, where's the, the damn trust? Why are you always fighting me? Why are you always injecting me with stuff? Exactly. Why are you always breaking my fucking ankles? So she takes him down to the basement and she lays him on the floor and closes the door, leaves it down there. So Sheriff Buster comes into her house to look around a little bit. And Annie is so diabolical that she invites the sheriff into the guest room where Paul has been staying. She even shows him the book that Paul has been writing, the manuscript that is sitting on the table, claiming it to be her own. And she even offers him a, a few hundred pages just to see what he thinks. And he refuses and so she goes to make him a cup of cocoa while the sheriff continues looking around. When she comes back with the cocoa, he says he doesn't really want to take up any more of her time, but he's going to go. He may come back later. So he is out the door and walking down the stairs back to his car when Paul is able to muster enough strength in the basement to knock over Annie's barbecue pit which makes so much noise and is so loud that the sheriff rushes back into the house to kind of check on Annie. And so when it it's when he's walking down the hall that he actually hears Paul screaming from the basement. He opens the basement door and he's really surprised to see that Paul Sheldon is alive, hurt, but sitting on this woman's basement floor. And so he's so surprised that he doesn't notice Annie coming up behind him with a shotgun. And Annie then fires the shotgun in the sheriff's back and blows a hole straight through his chest. And Sheriff Buster is dead. And that's Annie's first on-screen kill. It's so sad. It is sad. Because then you have to think, like, Virginia's going to be like, where is he? He never came back. And it's also just sad because it's like he really did solve it. Yes. Why would he go there by himself? Now, in the book, like I said before, Virginia and Buster don't exist. But a young cop does come looking for Paul Sheldon because at a certain point, he is reported missing. And so they are kind of sending out details to try to find him. It's another cop, a young, like a kid, comes by himself, and Paul actually screams to him. He gets his attention. He throws an ashtray out the window, and the kid sees him, and he's like, oh, shit, it's you. He has a picture of Paul Sheldon in his hand because he's looking for him, and Annie doesn't shoot him. She runs up, and she uses the cross from one of her cows died, like I said before, because she's so neglectful. She uses the cross that she'd made to put in the ground for her cow to stab the young cop a bunch of times. And then she takes a lawnmower and drives over first his arms and then his head. And that's how she kills him. She lawnmowers him to death. Much more interesting. Apparently, they did consider putting that scene in the movie, but it was cut because they thought that it would look funny. They thought that the audience would like laugh about it. So I don't know what it looked like, but that cop, you don't know his name. You have no connection to him. And so I was like, I think that's why 
they made Buster in Virginia so that when Buster dies, there's more weight to it that you feel like it to make you hate Annie because we know like we really like Buster so far um, and we really like his relationship with Virginia. And so I think that I just feel like that's why they crafted them to give the cop that dies a story so that you can be like, okay, yeah, Annie really is a horrible person. So now Annie who is totally calm and she tells <laughs> Paul that she knows why God brought them together. Um, it's to be together forever and that she's prepared for this moment. And she's loaded two bullets into her gun, one for him and one for her. And she says, well, we're no longer meant for this world. And so leaving together will be so beautiful. As Annie starts to come downstairs with a syringe full of something and her gun, Paul stops her by telling her that they should hold on a little bit longer just until the book is done to give misery back to the world. And Annie accepts this and she goes to get his wheelchair. And when she walks away, Paul stuffs a bottle of lighter fluid that he found in her basement in the back of his pants. So then she just super casually said that she's going to fix Paul something to eat as if she didn't just like murder a man. Now, later, so Paul is back trying to finish the novel. He's on the last chapter and he tells Annie to make it all perfect. He needs three things when he's done writing a book. And she already knows what those three things are. He needs the Dom Perignon. He needs one single cigarette and a match to light it with. And then they had her pronounce the Dom Perignon, Dom Perignon. And I was like, why? Because they want her to be like a dummy. Like a I big, d- like a big stupid dummy. Like a spam eating, country talking. I just like, I didn't, I didn't like that. It's just like another reason that Paul doesn't like her when he shouldn't like her because she fucking breaks his ankles. We didn't need her to be like an idiot, you know? But she goes and she loads the tray with the dom a glass, the cigarette and the match. And she brings it to him and she asks, did I do good? And he says she did perfect except, and she's worried, but this time he says, we're going to need two glasses to celebrate. And she is over the moon. So then when she leaves to go get that second glass, Paul throws his manuscript on the ground and he douses it with lighter fluid grabs a match and so when Annie walks in he tells her that all the answers that she's ever wanted to know about misery are in that last chapter that he wrote and he lights the match and he sets the chapter on fire and when she drops the champagne glass and yells Paul you can't he says why not I learned it from you and then he drops the flaming pages on the rest of the lighter fluid soaked manuscript and it goes up in flames as annie drops to the floor in front of the pile of flaming papers paul takes the 50 pound typewriter and he smashes it on on the top of annie's head kind of knocking her out for a minute her sleeve is on fire from kneeling next to the burnt manuscript And so she jumps up and she brushes the fire off of her sleeve. And then she tries to strangle Paul and she calls him a lying cocksucker. And this is like a big deal because she doesn't curse. So, you know, Annie is a homicidal at this point. He ends up socking her in the face. And when she falls backwards, she's able to pull out that gun and she ends up shooting him in the shoulder. But before she can get off another shot, Paul throws himself on her, falls on top of her. And then he ends up shoving a bunch of the charred manuscript down her throat. She ends up kneeing him in the testicles. And when she tries to get up, he clips her and she ends up smashing her head on the typewriter. And so she's laying there presumably dead in just like a pool of blood around her head. And so Paul is dragging himself out of the room 
Annie then jumps on top of him and they fight some more before Paul ends up grabbing this little metal pig like statue door stopper and he hits Annie in the face with it and it ends up killing her. So now we cut to 18 months later. Wasn't that the weirdest thing? I have a lot of feelings about this <sighs> ending. I have a lot of feelings. Because first, let me just say that in the book, obviously, this entire last part goes differently. The entire ending goes differently. But one of my biggest things was that Paul was really proud of that misery book that he was writing. And he says it often. And Annie says it too. It's the best book he's ever written. It's definitely the best misery book. And it's very different from the other misery books. I mean, he really cared about it and he was really pushed to write it. It was a lot darker. He takes it and he hides it. And he just takes some blank pages and douses them with lighter fluid and sets it on fire. But he cherishes that manuscript and he takes it and they release it. It's like his highest selling misery book to date. I hate it that he burned the actual manuscript in this movie because I guess I'm like, why? You did the work, you put in the work, you wrote the last chapter, and then you burned it, and it just didn't feel right. It didn't make sense to me. Their fight was kind of crazy. I was like, am I missing the part? It goes to 18 months, and that's like... Very anticlimactic. How did he get out of the house? Exactly. I did not like that. The so in the the book ending, and I I'm sorry to spoil it for you guys. I just I just the book has its flaws. Do not get me wrong. A lot of times, even their fight at the end, it's like sometimes it's like a little fantastical. You know, I'm like, okay, th- there's a lot happening. It's like Annie's not fucking Jason Voorhees, you know, but. Their fight lasts longer. He ends up locking Annie in the room. He ends up crawling to the bathroom and he locks himself in the bathroom and he takes a bunch of Novarol because he's in a lot of pain because they just got into this fight. He falls asleep in the bathroom. He comes out of the bathroom and the door is still locked. He's like the whole time he's expecting Annie to be there. But that's when the police come back because in the book, the police, she kills that young police officer, but now everything is really ratcheted up because they have a a larger police force than just Buster and his wife. But everything's ratcheted up because now a police officer's gone missing after he went to her property. So the police keep coming back. They get a search warrant. They come to the house and... It's this time when they have the search warrant, they see Paul. He starts screaming for them to help him and they kick in the door and they save him. And he's like, Annie Wilkes did this to me because he's missing a foot. There's a part that they don't include in the movie, but Annie also uses an electric turkey cutter and cuts off one of his thumbs. They don't put that in the movie, but she mutilates him a couple of times. And so the police come and they go to the room where Annie is supposed to be. And they're like, that room is empty. And Paul just starts screaming because he's terrified. Cause he's like, how could she have survived? And so then they do cut to New York. He's back in New York. He has a prosthetic foot. His legs had to be rebroken and reset. He's suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, but he finds out later after they go searching the property that she'd gotten out of the window in his room and they're like she stumbled her way to the barn and she ended up dying there because of the head wound that she sustained from falling and slamming it into the typewriter it actually fractured her skull so she has some bleeding on her brain but they were like when they found her she actually had her hand wrapped around her chainsaw So Paul knew that she was going to chainsaw him. And so I just thought that that was like a better ending. In the book, they talk about how he's struggling with the post-traumatic stress. He can't, he's having a hard time getting back into writing. He's having a hard time walking. He's just always in pain. 
His doctors won't let him take the codeine based medicine because he's an addict. So he has to take Advil. And so I just, I liked that ending better because I just thought it was more authentic. Um, then just like cutting to 18 months later and now he's back in New York and he's walking pretty fine just with a cane. He said he's having a hard time. He says that, yes. But he's at dinner with his agent and he's written a new non-misery book and apparently people are raving about it. But Paul says, you know, he doesn't really care about that. He wrote it for himself. Um, He says that as crazy as it sounds, the incident with Annie really kind of helped him as a writer. And his agent suggests that he write a nonfiction account of his ordeal with Annie. And he says that he doesn't really want to drudge up the worst ordeal of his life for a few bucks. And he admits that he really is not totally over it, even though he knows that she's dead. And as he's saying this, we're seeing a hallucination that he's having of Annie walking up to him in a waiter's uniform, um, pulling out a knife. But in reality, it's just a normal waitress who comes up to him and she actually stops and tells him that she's his number one fan. And he says, that's very sweet of you. And then the credits start to roll. And that is the end of the movie. That was such a weird ending. So yeah, th- I found this ending to be cock duty <laughs> It wasn't my favorite. I can't believe they ended that movie with, there's not even any like spooky music. No. I'm like, y'all, this is supposed to be a scary movie. And Paul is supposed to be like deeply traumatized. And he's just like, he's in a fucking pinstripe suit. I couldn't get jiggy with it. I didn't like it. It's like he went through a slight like like inconvenience. Exactly. And not like a traumatic ordeal. But you know what? In the movie, it is almost like what he went through was a slight inconvenience. I know that he experienced the hobbling, but comparatively, in the book, he gets his foot cut off, his thumb cut off. He's starved. He has this addiction that he's developed. I mean, she's done all kinds of stuff to him. I mean, there's a scene in the book where she's talking to him and she like digs her fingers into a rat so hard that she kills it. She squeezes it to death in her hands. Like what he went through was really, really, really traumatic in the book. And they, the movie just kind of doesn't, it falls short of driving home the trauma that he's endured and it it falls short in showing just how fucking diabolical Annie Wilkes is. And then it has that happy ass ending. I wasn't a fan of the way it ended. I definitely thought the book had a better ending for sure. A hundred percent. And I have my gripes about the book too, but I just think that the ending to this was a little lackluster. Very TV movie. Yes. Very Matlock. Yes. So the Rotten Tomatoes for this movie are really fucking high. It's a 91% critic and a 90% audience. And the IMDb score is a 7.8 out of 10 with 232,000 reviews. So let's get to the fun facts. So... Stephen King was super impressed with Kathy Bates' performance in the movie. He loved it, so much so that he wrote two more roles for her. So the title role in his novel, Dolores Claiborne, was written with Bates in mind. And then Bates later starred in the film adaptation of Dolores Claiborne. Um, And then King also wrote the script for the TV miniseries, The Stand. And his original novel featured a man named Ray Flowers. But upon hearing that Bates wanted to be involved in the miniseries, he rewrote the part for a woman just so Bates could be in it. So he thought she killed it as Annie. Wow. I know. She did go for what the script gave her. You're absolutely right by that. 
because Annie Wilkes was actually ranked the 17th most iconic villain in the American Film Institute's list of 100 heroes and villains. Who's number one? I don't know. But in 1991, Kathy Bates became the first woman to win an Oscar for Best Actress in a horror or thriller film. We know that that's super fucking rare. So Jack Nicholson was actually offered the role of Paul Sheldon. Um, He was one of the many people that was offered the role, but he passed because he was not sure he wanted to do another movie based on a Stephen King novel. After what he experienced making Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, because it was a horrible experience for everyone involved, apparently. But the screenwriter, so William Goldman, first suggested Kathy Bates to director Rob Reiner for Annie Wilkes' role. And he said she was our first and only choice for that. And she she did a really good job, so... But then beyond Jack Nicholson, so William Goldman, who wrote the script, he said that the studio approached almost every man in Hollywood to play this part. So Dustin Hoffman, Robert De Niro, Gene Hackman, Warren Beatty. And he said that everyone said no because the leading man would have been too passive. Because Paul Sheldon, especially in the book, I don't think that James Cann did a good job as Paul Sheldon. And I'm sorry to say that. Um, Kathy Bates really acted circles around him in this movie. And I feel like a huge part of that is because James Cann didn't believe in um, rehearsing. What do you mean he doesn't believe in rehearsing? Yeah, he didn't like to rehearse. He just liked to kind of go in and do the scene. That's something he always did? Yeah, that's just kind of how he operated. Kathy Bates did not like that. Because Kathy Bates is like a professional, like a stage performer. She's a classically trained actress. She likes to rehearse. And so they really clashed over that. And it fucking shows that he didn't read the book and he didn't like to rehearse. And I'm like, no fucking kidding. So they felt like the character wasn't strong enough to play? Yeah, they didn't want to play the role because they didn't want to be weak next to a woman because Paul is supposed to be the weak one and Annie has total control over him and other male actors did not want to play that role. That's crazy to me. It's crazy. So then nobody wanted to play it because they said it was weak and then he came in and he was just like, I don't give a shit about this movie. Just do what I want. Yeah, I think he also probably didn't want to appear weak because Paul is supposed to be totally like broken. That's the character as written. And this the like James Can didn't do any of that. He didn't give us that at at no point. He just constantly it just kind of always felt like he was maintaining some level of control just like him um flicking her off. And man- manipulating her to go to that dinner. Yeah, it's just like, I, d- I didn't like that. So he must have felt like trash when she walked away with an Oscar. I hope not. I hope he didn't think he was uh, going <laughs> to get an Oscar for that fucking performance. <laughs> uh, sir, I need you to have several seats. There's a Broadway adaptation of this, and Bruce Willis and Laurie Metcalf play Paul and Annie. And I was like, okay. I know that was good. I was like, Lori Metcalf she is nuts. Is nuts. <laughs> I was like, what a great fucking choice for Annie. I love that. So one last one. After refusing to speak about his motivation for writing Misery for like 20 years, so Stephen King finally came out and he stated that the book really is about his battle with substance abuse. So Kathy Bates' character, so Annie, is just like a representation of his dependency on drugs and what it did to his body, making him feel alone and separated from everything while crippling any attempts that he made to escape. So in his statement, he said he did not come out with it at the time because he wasn't ready and because he was afraid that it would detract from the story. 
But that's why it's so bizarre to me that they took out all of the addiction stuff from the movie because the story, the crux of the story is about a battle addiction. with addiction. I just, I guess they did that to make it more palatable to a, a wider audience because like drugs is like a taboo thing. But yeah, that's, that's, it's the, it's a very personal story for him because it's about his struggle. Well, what do you think? I know that we had our gripes, but do you think that it's a hit or a miss? I want to say it's a hit because Kathy Bates' performance in this movie is great. And that to me makes it, that it makes the movie. I agree. Okay. I, this is very controversial, but I'm going to have to give it a miss. I know that that is controversial. And if you'd asked me when I was younger, I think I would have said that I would give it a hit. I do think that people should watch it. But this is this is one of the... It's like a hardcore example to me of the book being better. And it's I usually think that the book is better. But I also really like movies too. You know, like I can watch, like I think that it is really good. I love the book. I think the movie's like equally as good. But I just feel like I, I can't give it a hit because I know a better story than the one that I was presented. I got the book and it deviates so radically from the book. And like you said, I think you used a perfect word for it. It was sanitized. So yeah, I, I just have to say it's a miss. And I feel bad for saying that because I think that Kathy Bates knocked it out of the park with her performance. So it's like I give Kathy Bates a hit, but overall the movie a miss. So yeah, that is um, Misery. Do you want to tell them about the social media? Yes, please like and subscribe on our YouTube channel. Did you get that on film? We're on IG always. Did you get that on film? As well as Facebook. It's all did you get that on film? Also, the email did you get that on film at Gmail, just in case there is no social media in your life. We love to hear from you all. So, again, that's Gmail, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. So, with that being said, I think it's time to end this episode. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We'll see you next week with a new episode. Bye.